I love them all popping up. <laughs> all right, well, Keshi, hello. Welcome relatives and allies, newcomers to today's Healthy Native Youth Community Practice Call. Um, we are focusing on digital media. Media literacy is power. Thank you for joining us as we gather around our virtual tables and honor the power of talking and sharing with one another. I'll start by introducing myself, um, then we'll move on to a blessing before our guest speakers introduce themselves. Um, so Keshi, Kotalea, um, Ho Amanda Gaston, Let Shina, Ho Ibashina Shiwi, Dayan Chemakwe, Hom Hota Deakona Jachu, Le Shina Ke, Hom Hota Tlashi, Deakona Yawaki, Le Shina Ke, Hom Sita Dona Chatli, Hom Dachu Chemakwe, An Sita Dachu Kakuska, Dat Rogi Let Nashina Ke, Elakwa. My name is Amanda Gaston. I'm from the Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. Uh, my grandmother um, was a Jachu and my great grandmother was a Yawaki. My mother is the child of the Turkey clan and my German uh, paternal grandparents are the Kakuska and the Rogi. I'm also Ask Auntie from the We Are Native uh, Q&A service and I use she and her pronouns. So I will pass it off to uh, Miss Michelle Singer to get us started with the blessing um, before we move on. Yat Ehebene, good morning to everyone on the call this morning. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Amanda. I'd like to offer this um, this morning. Great Spirit, we thank you for this new day and the opportunity to bring us together on behalf of our young people and those who engage them. We ask that our minds, our hearts, and our spirits be open to receive the good words and information shared during the community of practice. Watch over us in this virtual circle of learning and may our ears and our eyes process this information in a helpful and kind way to help our youth, our families, and our communities. In gratitude, Creator, we thank you and Kehat all our relations. Elakwa, Michelle, thank you so much for starting us off properly. Um, I introduced myself, um, but I uh, guess a little bit more background. Um, before coming to the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, um, I was a teacher um, and I obviously work with healthy Native youth, um, but I work with the adolescent health team. Um, we are Native as our um, youth version, um, our multimedia health resource uh, for youth that I've been working on uh, with this lovely team. So I'll go ahead and pass it over uh, to Dr. Stephanie Craig Rushing, um, and then we can go down the line. Good morning, everyone. I am Stephanie Craig Rushing, and I work with this team at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board on our Adolescent Health Promotion Team. And today's topic feels very relevant because I have two little people who are like core age group for this conversation. And um, every day we're kind of living this media literacy world in our household. So um, I'm excited to and it also feels very timely, sort of the recommendations that have been coming out recently. So um, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Jane. Hello, hi, my name is Jane Manthai. Um, I work at the board with all of these lovely folks and I am the text messaging coordinator for the board. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about youth and cell phones and how we use technology as a tool and also how it can be problematic sometimes. Um, I also have a background in education. I was a science teacher in a high school prior to moving into this position. And so I've seen um, I've seen the conversation about media literacy change and evolve over the last couple of years, um, especially in these last two years or so. I will pass it over to Taylor. Hatzlhel, Taylor Dean Seedstadt, Spiala Bubschuth. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Taylor Dean, and I am a member of the Puyallup tribe. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. 
and I work at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board as the Healthy Native Youth Outreach Specialist. Uh, I also have a background in education prior to working at the board. I was an avid tutor, and then I was a substitute teacher as well, and I have seen all of the effects that media has had on youth today um, when I was working in those positions, and I'm really excited to share some resources with all of you that will hopefully help. Well, awesome. Thank you guys uh, for being with us um, <clears throat> and leading this conversation. So um, a quick note, um, we have a Mentimeter activity coming up um, and this group is super chatty, which I love in the chat box. So you can use this as an opportunity to network. Um, you can scroll through your tribal Brady Bunch there. Um, and we've got the private uh, message enabled. So if you want to do a little networking, this is a really great opportunity. You'll also notice that throughout the slides, we'll have these Indigi icons at the top, top right corner. Um, the male or female elder um, indicates that we're modeling a skill or a tool that you can use with your youth. The cedar hat is a sharing a strategy. The multicolored corn is um, a place where we can think about being two-spirit LGBTQ inclusive. And then the medicine shaker um, is us sharing our experience and our knowledge with each other. So welcome, welcome, welcome again. Um, thanks for folks who have already started um, typing into the chat there. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, um, this will help with the networking here too. Um, but you can uh, get used to the chat right now by putting in your name, your pronouns if you're comfortable, um, your tribes uh, or organization. And then it's always nice to start off with a question um, about what you're hoping to learn today. So this is a really big, juicy topic. Um, you can start typing that into the chat now. And while you're doing that, I'll just kind of move on here. Um, so normally during these calls, if you are here um, every month, we take a moment to um, remind folks about group agreements as an activity and a tool for creating safe space with our youth. So I'm going to switch that a little bit and talk about digital learning agreements. Um, so this can also help to maintain safe spaces and it's obviously like right on topic here. Um, this activity you can do preferably at the start um, of any discussion um, is where you're talking about the expectations for online communication, you're talking about privacy and safety, device use and more um, with your middle and high school um, students. So throughout this call, we're gonna share lots of resources. One in particular is Common Sense Education. Um, and we'll put those chats in the link or the links in the chat along the way as well. Um, but this is a really wonderful, it's a Google Doc that you can um, update, um, change. It's also in Spanish if you need it in Spanish as well. But it's got a checklist for folks um, and it breaks it down kind of into these categories here. Um, and it's really lovely to take the pressure off of thinking about like all the things that are included when you're talking about digital learning with youth. Um, so this is a super helpful tool to put in your toolbox. Um, you can make copy the copies of this, put it in front of your binders or print out um, an enlarged copy that you post in the room. You can take screenshots, add it to your slides um, if you're having virtual meetings, just as a reminder of the positive culture um, that you've agreed to with you. We've got goals, <laughs> as always. Uh, so by the end of today's session, you will be able to examine technology user rates um, and developmentally appropriate screen time recommendations. You'll be able to identify strategies for avoiding tech battles and activating parental controls. You'll be able to select media literacy and digital citizenship lesson plans, resources, and professional development trainings. And we always like to also include a cultural teaching or focus. Um, so for today, it is, if we wonder often, the gift of knowledge will come. And that's an Arapaho um, quote. 
And we all like to know where we're going. Um, so we've mapped out our journey for today. And as a heads up, we're gonna load you up with resources, articles, and links. Um, we are recording the session and we will share out the chat feed and the slides. So you can come back to those at different points in time. We will start off with a Mentimeter activity um, and you can start thinking about these two questions now. So we will ask you, what are the issues that are facing, um, that you are facing with youth in regards to digital media. And then the second question is, what are some of the solutions you have found to deal with these issues? So you can kind of put those questions in the back of your head. Um, after the Mentimeter activity, we'll move on to developmental guidelines, um, taking a look at screen time recommendations and what's appropriate for age groups. We'll then go to community communication, um, which will look at avoiding tech battles at home and school and creating boundaries with tools like family media use plans. The technology and information literacy piece will talk about um, what digital, digital citizenship is and how we can support it with lesson plans um, from common sense education and healthy native youth media literacy um, standalone lesson. We will finish up with some resources for both parents and educators before we open up the call to discussion. So again, this is a massive topic that we're gonna be tackling today. So we wanna make sure that we leave enough room um, at the end of the call for folks to open up their lines. So if you wanna start jotting down your questions that we can share with each other at the end of the call, um, please do so. All right, um, so we'll start with this Mentimeter activity um, and James just posted that link into the chat here. And if you haven't done a Mentimeter activity before, no worries. Um, you can join by either clicking on that link. Um, oh, and I went too fast for the QR code there. Um, let me go back to that real quick. If you're on a single device and you wanna uh, take your phone, um, you can just scan it over that QR code there, and then you can join for your, from your phone as well. And then Jane, if you wouldn't mind copying down the code, uh, that 5233647 and put it in the chat. Um, if folks miss the QR code, they can type that in once they go to Mentimeter. All right. Um, so you can start typing in your answers there. Um, so the question we'll start off with is, what are the issues that you are facing with your youth in regards to digital media? Did someone put in time limits there? And you can just click on the on the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, that should be able to pop up a little space where you can type in your um, responses. Getting youth followers, having them see your content, safety, lack of social interactions due to digital media access, making sure they are using it safely, pornography, grooming, bullying, and body image dysmorphia, knowing what sites my kids are using. Yep, time limits, online safety, the lack of accountability for harm, learning to balance utilizing digital media and positive productive ways in schools, jobs, and careers. Not a ton of easy, understandable content about this subject. All right, hopefully we'll fill in some gaps here to share with our community. Our elder caregivers not understanding digital media, so not able to have conversations with youth about safety. Yep, students filming students and posting it on social media without their permission. Yep, we'll talk about um, that in the digital citizenship piece. What are good boundaries and expectations? Yep, not focused in the moment. Misuse of technology, accessibility to our content, online safety for apps like Roblox. Yep. Self-diagnosis, addiction, overuse, collaborative community messaging. Youth are on devices for too long. Yep, start using it at a very young age. Um, how can we recommend time limit for youth when they are needing to use devices, screens for school and studying? I suspect social media is contributing to anxiety. That seems to be an epidemic. Oh, these are great. Yep, privacy for self and others, misinformation, removal of interpersonal communication skills, 
unaware of how serotonin operates in our brains for from too much unlearned, unearned serotonin. Yep, fake information. Excellent. Well, continue to keep typing in there. And I didn't mention if you have um, troubles accessing the Mentimeter link, uh, go ahead and put that into um, the chat there. And I see a, a few folks have done that already. All right, and for the sake of time, we'll move to the second question. And some folks have already started there. Um, so what are some of the solutions you have found to deal with these issues? And I, I reckon these ones that are already posted here are for the previous question. Let's see if I can reset that. Okay, I'm not going to reset it because I don't want to lose the other one. So, <laughs> yeah. So, thinking of some solutions that we've found to deal with our challenges critical thinking, parenting blocking apps, yes, suggested screen times, advocacy, media literacy, firm boundaries, autonomy. Awesome. Safety youth voice, limiting device use, no phone, monitoring apps, staying involved, awareness, encouraging family time, discussing openly. PimaHelpline.org. Community advisory committees, going outside, Awesome. So I'll let folks continue populating that. And then after the call, we will be able to share with folks. Um, we can download the results and share it out with folks after the call. Um, but just to get us started thinking um, and get our minds going. So I'll go ahead and pass this off to Dr. Stephanie Craig Rushing to talk about developmental guidelines um, and a little bit about community communication. Great, thank you, Amanda. If you wanna to click to the next slide. I do kind of wanna preface the conversation that you know there are some distinctions between screen time in general and social media, media usage. So we'll want to sort of think about that too today, um, the distinctions between just being on screens um, versus using social media and those channels and what, what youth are exposed to in those spaces. Um, but the most recent CDC report on, on youth screen time asked parents um, of different age groups what um, their youth were exposed to if it were two or more hours per day. So we can see even amongst the youngest age groups, um, two to five, that almost 50% of youth were getting more than two hours a day. And for our older teens, um, it was nearly 75% having over the two hour recommendation. So um, that is no doubt what we're experiencing in our homes. Um, especially post COVID. Um, so next slide, we'll see that that screen time is pretty broadly defined. So that includes, you know, at a TV or spending time on a computer, iPads, gaming. Um, and so when we were asking parents about the average number of hours their students are spending on um, screens for the six to 10 year olds, that was six hours. And then um, the oldest age group had the medium amount. So those are the kids that might be in sports um, a little more than the that middle age group. But even the 11 to 14 year olds were getting up to out eight, nine hours of screen time a day on average. So that is no doubt um, a lot of exposure and more exposure than the recommendations. So, um, you know, we're kind of in a space now 
post COVID thinking about how can we um, help our families and our schools um, cut back on some of that screen time. Next slide. We have also surveyed youth in the um, American Indian Alaska Native teens from our We Are Native website and um, gotten a snapshot of their use of technology. And, and our goals always for the We Are Native website is you know, really helping communicate to youth on the channels that they're on. And because those channels are always changing, um, we often um, kind of look for their input on the best ways and the best channels to communicate with them on. So I'll share a little bit of data from our last 2020 Youth Health Tech Survey. It has a nice broad range of ages that our um, community typically uh, encompasses. So we've got 15 to 24 year olds from all across the country. Um, and the average age was just about uh, 19 years old. So a nice broad sample of folks that are accessing the health information on our website and social media channels. Next slide. We also had um, a lot of participation from across all gender identities and sexual orientations, which was really lovely. And um, we often hear in the literature that um, mental health for gender diverse youth can be, you know, even more affected by social media use. And um, we were seeing some of those trends in the data as well that that um, our gender diverse youth were reporting lower mental health um, as in the survey as well. Next slide. So on average, um, the youth in our survey were um, saying that they use social media three to four hours a day. Um, and that was like right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I imagine um, these trends have just continued to increase slightly over time. Um, and of course, TikTok has really taken off in the last couple of years. And that was, um, you know, a channel that hasn't had as much um, use historically. And so with the growth of that channel, there are, you know, more and more youth impacted by the messaging that they're seeing on TikTok as well. Next slide. When we asked youth what channels they wanted to get health information on, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok were the three that kind of hit the highest um, levels and are the channels that we use to promote health. And when we ask them more specifically about what they're doing on those channels, um, over 86% said they were scrolling through the, their feeds and 75% said watching videos. So those are two of the things that kind of guide, guide our work. We also ask youth what topics they want more information on through our channels and identity and cultural pride, mental health and social justice and equity were all issues that they were expressing interest in. Um, so we know from this information that, you know, especially mental health are, are topics that they cared about. Next slide. We asked them very specifically about the types of mental health topics um, that they were hoping to learn more about. And this little word cloud is designed by the number of times each youth put in a response. So how to cope and depression were both um, frequently included responses, but we have LGBT and PTSD, um, anxiety, COVID, money, a lot of topics that we can see really um, of interest to the youth that, that we work with. 
Next slide. So that's kind of where <laughs> social media and technology use are right now. And we know that, you know, doesn't align with the recommendations that have come out in terms of our social media use and um, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics has just come out with recommendations around um, limiting screen time. So I think we're all sort of recognizing at the same time that um, there will be a need for us to collectively work together to help create more safe spaces for our youth. And, you know, it's going to take efforts on many fronts, both in the home and in the classrooms, um, in our after school programs, um, our weekend programming. So um, it's something that we all collectively will have to work on moving forward. The recommendation for those under two years old is zero screen time. For two to five year olds, that's no more than an hour a day and preferably co watching with a parent. And then for five to 17 year olds, um, the recommendation is no more than two hours per day outside of homework. So um, that's that's the new recommendation. And of course, the next part of this is while there are recommendations, what are those tangible things that we can think about doing that will help us? And, and part of today, we'll be talking about those tangible ideas. Um, but those are things like limiting screen time in bedrooms or filling those hours with other activities like sports or outside activities, um, cultural events, um, and then monitoring their use. So having computers and screens in shared spaces so you can see what your kids are doing in real time. That's the latest. And next slide. And of course, at this same time, we're kind of like um, butting up against these technologies that are designed to hook our attention and draw us in. And the data really is showing that, you know, youth who are spending a lot of time comparing themselves to the images that they see on these social media channels, it is linked to poor body image and those mental health challenges that we were talking about. So, um, you know, finding ways to kind of use this media literacy that we're talking about today to help youth understand that the images that they're seeing aren't authentic or true or um, kind of destigmatize what it is that their experience while also cutting back on that social media use. Um, so I think that's kind of the background that will set the stage for today's conversation. Finding my unmute button. Yep, thank you, Steph. Um, and Jane just put in uh, a couple links in the chat. So the screen time recommendation poster, that's great for printing out and posting around uh, community spaces. And then uh, this is a great um, lesson plan that you can download. It's got slides and handouts, um, but that's on how algorithms influence our lives. Um, so that's a good one to check out there. And I, I guess we can pause too and see if anyone else on the team has anything sort of in that background that they want to share or... Uh, no, but one really quick thing, um, as I'm looking at this list of how we all get captured by our devices and by these algorithms, um, a really common theme between all of these is that they're designed to feed you the next piece of information so that you don't even notice that you're scrolling on to the next part. Or, you know, it doesn't have numbers showing how many pages you've been through. And so there's no way to know that you've been scrolling for the past hour because in your mind, it's just, oh, I wanna see this next video. Uh, I wonder what happens next. So, and yeah, and, and as Becky Jones just put in the comments, you know, doom scrolling is a dangerous thing to do on so many levels um, because it's, it's stressful and we feel that in our bodies, but we're still just like scrolling on autopilot. 
totally. I put in the chat my <laughs> seven-year-old I was having to redirect. He's like, I don't even know how I got here. <laughs> I partly believe you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Jane, um, for that background there. Um, so we'll move on and I'll pass this over to uh, Jane and Taylor. Um, where this next piece will be around community communication, um, so avoiding tech battles and creating boundaries with things like family media use plans. Um, and we'll talk about parental controls in this piece here too. Yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, avoiding tech battles, and to preface all of this, I am very aware uh, that these are things that are easy to say and are much more difficult to actually implement, especially over a long period of time. So um, I, would, I would hope that you think of these as suggestions and maybe additional tools to keep in your toolbox, as opposed to like, oh, you just need to do this one thing and then all of our problems will be solved because that's not true. This is a complicated uh, problem that we have and it's it requires like a community level of support. So parents, teachers, caring adults, anyone. Um, avoiding tech battles is going to be about device ownership, uh, device storage, monitoring, engaging and playing games with youth um, and watching and talking about movies and TV shows. So one way that we can support youth is by helping our caregivers with resources to feel confident about setting up boundaries within the home. Uh, you can think of the boundaries that you've set up within your schools and organizations and how those can transfer and be shared with caregivers. Um, you know, some examples, if we think about it as all devices belong to the grown-ups and are used by the children with permission. Uh, so if a, a youth says, for example, where's my iPad, you can respond with, it's not your iPad, it's the school's, it's grandma's, it's the adult's iPad, and you're allowed to use it as long as we stick to our agreements. Uh, another suggestion would be that all devices are kept out of children's bedrooms. If it's set up as an expectation and is followed through with consistency, those arguments will start to diminish. Uh, that in classrooms looks like charging stations where students plug in their phones at the back of the classroom and then they don't access it for the rest of that course period. Um, and also having shared spaces where those youth can use that technology, but it's in a more communal setting instead of sitting isolated. Another really key part that does help to address um, some of those concerns that were brought up in the Mentimeter is to monitor what youth are doing when they're on the devices. It's really nice to think that youth can be on a device unattended, but you know, because of the uh, design features, youth are often pulled away from the approved sites or shows because images and text flash quickly to grab their attention. So using a classroom management tool, just something like proximity, you know, just a quick glance around the room um, and keeping an eye on what's on the student's screens can help students stay on task. And if needed, you can redirect them again with reminders of the digital agreements. Um, you can also use it as a way to engage with youth. Uh, so, you know, asking what are youth's favorite content and getting them to, and having a conversation with them about it, but also going and making sure that you're consuming some of that content yourself. Um, the best way to protect our youth is to be informed. And that means knowing what it is that they're consuming when they're online and understanding how these algorithms work. Uh, also, engage with your children when they're using technology and playing games. So ask them to show you their favorite game uh, or their favorite app. And it's, uh, it's, it's all about relationship building. So, um, you know, watching and talking about movies and TV shows, that's a good way to talk about sensitive topics with youth. Um, especially because then you don't have to create a scenario or imply that your youth are behaving or engaging in certain behaviors. Uh, and instead, there's a common point that you're discussing, which is external to anything that the youth may be personally experiencing, and instead something that you're both watching and consuming at the same time. Um, next slide, please. And so, uh, you know, we talk about creating healthy, talk about creating healthy boundaries and agreements a lot in these calls, because that's how we establish those healthy boundaries, and that's how we start to create these safe spaces. So, uh, you know, you can treat 
the management of the algorithm uh, as, as a family approach, as a community level approach. That would mean creating a family media agreement that you review and revise as needed. Uh, that would mean honoring age restrictions for social media and games, um, including not setting up accounts for them using your birth dates, um, maybe because they're too young to be on a certain device. You know, TikTok is explicitly for 13 and over, and you will get banned if it turns out that a child is using TikTok, um, particularly if they're creating content. And teaching safe, responsible, and kind use of technology, um, both in their personal interactions and also like when they're interacting with strangers online. And one of the most important ones is making sure that your children know that they can come to you if they get in trouble online. Um, you have to be that safe space for them as they're navigating this world that very few of us are familiar with. Uh, and yes, thank you, Amanda, for putting these family media plans in the chat. I can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> um, but yeah, like there are ways that we can work together as an entire family and with our youth, uh, as opposed to setting it up as a confrontation or thinking of it as a battle. And instead, it's a challenge that you're approaching together because you're on the same page. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and with that, I will hand it off to Taylor. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some applications that you can use to monitor your children's device usage. Um, I grew up in the era of, you know, computers and iPhones, and my parents set up a lot of boundaries around those when I was growing up. I hated it as a teen, but now that I'm an adult, I am actually very appreciative that my parents held really strong boundaries. And I see how that um, positively impacted me now, um, now that I can I can advocate for myself and set better boundaries around social media and my phone because I learned those skills young. So we've got Apple Screen Time, Android Digital Wellbeing, and Q Studio. So Apple Screen Time lets you see exactly how much time your kids are spending on their phones and tablets. It can show you what time of the day is they're most active um, and which apps they're using the most. You can also set time limits on how long your kid uses their phone. Uh, you can filter inappropriate content and you can shut down the device remotely whenever you feel like it. Um, if they can't control themselves, if your kids can't control themselves around a certain app like TikTok or a game, you can cut them off from that app specifically for a certain amount of time or on certain days, like during school days. Um, and you can also limit entire categories of apps. So like social media apps or, you know, video apps you can completely remove from their phone. Um, and you can also um, set screen time limits for them. So once they hit that limit, they're no longer allowed to use it. And the kid can then request more time, which you can approve or not approve. Uh, Android's digital well-being app is basically Google's uh, version of the Apple screen time app for Android devices. And I want to also preface by saying that um, Apple screen time can be used for any Apple um, handheld device. So iPads and iPhones are included. And the, the Android version of this would be similar. So Android tablets and phones, um, dig Android's digital well-being can be used for. But essentially, it does the same thing, but for Android devices. Uh, Quo Studio um, is an app for your desktop as well as mobile devices. Um, so it could be used for either Android or Apple products, but also your desktop. Um, and this also tracks their social media usage. This can block websites um, and it also helps keep kids safe by tracking their location. 
Um, it's $5 a month for the basics, which includes game and app blocking, daily time limits, um, website filtering, location monitoring, and pausing the internet. But what makes this one different is it can be used for your desktop at, or any type of device. So I'd like to talk about being a role model for our youth when it comes to social media. Um, asking yourself questions like, am I aware of my own behavior? Am I honoring the social media agreements that we're um, having our kids sign? Um, am I present when I'm with my youth? So as, as caring adults, relatives, educators, it's always good to do these self inventories by asking ourselves essential questions to assess our thinking and behaviors and to be accountable to our youth. And if we're if I'm being frank, we know that as tribal people, we learn experientially, we learn by observing and then doing. And if our youth, especially our littlest ones, are observing us on our devices and we're only half-heartedly engaging with them with a phone in hand or a device at the table or in uh, during like family dinners, there's screens on in the background, then our kids are going to learn from that. They will, they will do as they observe. Uh, and so just remember to cut yourself a break. If you find yourself doing these things um, you're asking your kids or your youth not to do, just take a deep breath and be aware of that behavior. Be aware of your surroundings, what you're feeling and set an intention for the future. The most important piece of this is to be aware without judgment. And this will help you um, open up greater conversations and have more consistent self-awareness. It's a moment to be compassionate with yourself and keep in mind that our kindness towards others first takes seed within ourselves. So you can always just laugh at yourself in the moment. Um, so I just, I just really encourage all of us to take these questions into account in front of our youth. And I would like deep breath. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, pass it to you, Amanda. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jane and Taylor, um, for walking us through some of that. And yeah, you know, some of the the comments in the chat. Yeah, I think we yeah need to remember to be um, have the awareness, be non judgmental, and be kind to ourselves. And so, you know, we'll take a beat here, and we do like to incorporate these wellness moments. Um, so. This is um, a little video and we'll put the chat or the link in the chat too um, and share this as well. But if we talk about how important these things like wellness moments. So sitting comfortably, we should do them just taking a big deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. As you breathe in, noticing how the body expands. As you breathe out, just watching the body soften. As you gently close the eyes. And rather than the mind leading the breath, allow the breath to lead the mind. Notice the sensation of the breath. Notice it where you feel it in the body. If you need to, you can just gently place your hand on the stomach. And just following that rising and falling sensation. Nothing else to do, allowing thoughts to come and go. And when you're ready, just gently opening the eyes again. I always feel so much better doing this. <laughs> My shoulders are coming down. <laughs> All right, well, we'll move on to the third piece here, um, technology and information literacy. And within that framework is digital citizenship. We do know that technology offers youth lots of really great and wonderful opportunities for self-exploration and creativity, connection and learning um, through digital media. But we also know that youth 
are experiencing things like oversharing and damage to reputation, cyberbullying, not understanding how to analyze and evaluate the credibility of information. Um, so we'll talk about a few of those pieces in this next section. Um, and of course, as Steph mentioned, we also know that youth are spending incredible amounts of time in front of the screens. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about how to um, work with these challenges here. So um, as I mentioned within technology and information literacy, um, digital citizenship includes four parts that we'll touch on, including resources to help build up those areas. To harness technology for learning, um, youth need to learn how to think critically, behave safely, and participate responsibly online. And that breaks down into these four areas, um, intellectual property, privacy and security, responsible communication, and online reputation. So in these upcoming slides, um, I will be sharing a lot of resources um, from Common Sense Education. Um, and I can't say enough about them. I really got lost on their website. And there's so many really wonderful resources that are all put together for you. Um, Hopefully that won't be too overwhelming. Um, just a reminder, we'll share the chat with the links in there. We'll share the slides afterwards. Um, but I won't be offended at all um, if you open up another browser and start perusing their site, saving and bookmarking their materials. Um, and we'll throw that common sense um, education link in the chat now for folks to do that. So, Intellectual property is the ownership of something you create, um, giving you a right to how others use it. In terms of digital citizenship, we're focusing on the rights and responsibilities of using and sharing intellectual property. So this applies the principles of creative credit and copyright. Creative credit and copyright are giving the owner of the original creation credit or acknowledgement of their work. So all that really means um, is that if you're using a photo or an image, a video, a quote, or a source of information, you let other folks know that by including some subtext, um, citing it. Um, we have modeled that for you throughout the slides by including, including citations, links, um, screenshots with organization names, and image credits throughout. And the slides we post after the call are hyperlinked, um, which is for easy access, um, as well as to honor the intellectual property of others. So these principles can get into the weeds pretty easily. Um, so without getting too hung up on the semantics, if youth are not the original creators of materials, this is where we want to encourage them to give credits to the folks who are. So I did find a grade four lesson plan. Um, this one here that breaks down intellectual property pretty easily. Um, it helps youth with images they find online um, and understanding which images are okay to use and which ones aren't. I would definitely recommend having a look at it. Um, and if you're wanting to talk to youth about it, you can certainly adapt it for higher grades. And it's super informal. Um, <laughs> it was for me anyway. And then privacy and security. So this is where we manage personal data to maintain digital privacy and security and are aware of data collection technology used to track navigation online. Privacy and security is a big one um, because, it, because it comes with protecting our youth. I would definitely check with your school or organization to see what policies are already in place first. Um, and share those social media guidelines with families. You can post them in your youth or tribal newsletters, um, hosting a family or community night um, that focuses on social media and device responsibility at both home and school. And this infographic um, is really, I mean, it breaks it all down for you. It does the like legwork for you, um, but this is keep yourself, um, your students and yourself safe on social media. And Jane's put that into the chat as well, I think. Um, but that 
this can definitely help to facilitate those conversations um, with your community uh, and your families. And there's also this really wonderful um, free one hour training um, from Common Sense Education, and it will give you more information on why privacy is important um, and the best practices for managing the risk to youth when using technology. It shares specific tools and methods for assessing the privacy and security of products that are commonly used uh, within the classroom. And they have a really nice incentive that they give folks, um, which is a certificate of completion um, that you can earn badge points uh, for uh, with common sense education. <clears throat> and then for responsible communications, um, this helps us to have positive, respectful, responsible, and safe online communication um, and relationships. So as we think about how to have positive, respectful, and responsible communication uh, and relationships online, finding activities and lesson plans around the role that digital media plays in our lives, of how social media affects the way that we feel or why there might be frustration or guilt um, around being sucked into the rabbit hole of social media or YouTube. Um, we can find some great resources here um, that include lesson plans, youth handouts, slides, quizzes, uh, as well as take home activities. So this first one, uh, my digital life is like, um, this looks at the role that social media plays in youth's lives um, by doing some metacognitive work. So thinking about one's thinking, youth get to pay attention to how and how much they use digital media in order to find better balance uh, by considering how digital media adds to or takes away from their overall quality of life. Can media be addictive? Um, this one is an 11th grade lesson plan. Um, and this one looks more into the clickbait, um, what Steph uh, shared earlier on um, by capturing by design. This lesson plan is geared to help students recognize how most of the technology that they do use is designed to keep them hooked um, and helps them use this as an opportunity to find more balance uh, in their digital lives. The social media and how you feel lesson um, gets into the mental health piece that we've been touching on. So this lesson in particular focuses on the major role that social media plays in teens' lives um, and the intense feelings, which can be both positive and negative um, associated with their use. It does look at the benefits that come with uh, both active and passive media use. And it, it encourages youth to become creators of digital media, not just consumers for the better um, social and emotional well being of the youth. And there's a fresh article that came out yesterday that um, Stephanie shared with the team uh, before the call, um, and it's on the harms of social media use. And um, I think we've got that to share. We'll share that link out as well. So it's all pretty timely, as we've mentioned, and you know, all of this is getting updated, you know, as we're speaking. <laughs> And then um, if you do spend some time on the Common Sense Education website, you'll see um, lots of their great lessons. Um, but this last one here that I'll mention for the responsible communication piece um, is the effect, uh, the health effects of screen time. This lesson addresses how research um, is still out um, when it comes to exactly how much screen time affects your health. But um, one area where we do know that it's conclusive is um, the impacts on sleep. So this lesson helps youth understand simple behaviors. Um, and I feel like this is so helpful for all of us. <laughs> um, like how our brains, uh, our behaviors change when a device is near us. Um, and that seems to change yeah, how our brain works. Um, and it helps youth um, think about how they can adjust those behaviors so that it isn't um, unhealthy for their bodies or their brains. Um, 
which is responsible uh, relationships with ourselves. And then the last component of digital citizenship is online reputation. So we want youth to cultivate and manage digital identity and reputation, as well as to be aware of the permanence of the actions in the digital world. So this is a nice um, youth geared video and there's a ton of youth videos for youth um, on this common sense uh, education site. Um, and, and certainly if others have other recommendations for the group, if folks wanna put those into the chat as well, um, that would be a lovely sharing opportunity. So the We Are Civil Communicators um, lesson plan this will help youth to engage online both calmly and coolly <laughs> um, so they can find common ground, um, deeper understanding with others online. And it also teaches youth to keep disagreements civil um, so that their ideas will be heard and that this gives them an opportunity to advocate for positive change. All right, um, and so, um, we do have a, a media literacy plan up on the Healthy Native Youth website, um, and those are under our standalone lessons. And this one in particular focuses on how to critically evaluate digital media, and it uses the We Are Native website as an example for this critique. And you'll see that we break it down into time recommendations, objectives, um, what materials are needed, um, and what you need to do uh, in preparation for the lesson. And in the critique, they're looking at five key media literacy components, uh, which happen to be authorship, uh, format, audience, content, and purpose. Um, they've got a list of helpful definitions there, and it breaks it down into what uh, each of these means, what are the key questions, the guiding questions, and then what are the criteria for um, quality health resources. And the youth activities that they have um, will help to um, use those key um, critiques in evaluating uh, the We Are Native website. And you'll see that we've got it you know, scripted out for folks. So this is a really easy one to just pick up and uh, kind of run with uh, after you've read the lesson through. I feel like I did a lot of talking there. Um, so if there's questions and uh, yeah, comments, feel free to add those into the chat. But I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Taylor, um, who will share a little bit on some resources. Um, for both parents and educators. So um, like we said, we've got uh, Common Sense Media, uh, Google's Be Internet Awesome, Google's Digital Wellbeing, uh, CSM's uh, Parenting Media and Everything in Between, CSM's Ultimate Guide to Parental Controls, um, How to Make a Family Media Use Plan, um, the Big Disconnect, Protecting Children and Families, Relationships in the Digital Age by Catherine Cedar Adair and Teresa Baker. Uh, Plugged In, Parenting, How to Raise Media Savvy Kids with Love, Not War. Um, growing Up Social, Raising Relational Kids in a Screen Device Driven World by Adrian Pelican and Gary Chapman. Uh, reconsidering screen time, research, reason, and real life, how much screen time is too much for kids, and screen time versus lean time infographic. So all of these can be accessed through the slideshow. Um, will we be um, offering the slideshow to our participants, Amanda? Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, you can click on these links, and a lot of these are hyperlinks that you can find. And then for educators, we have the digital citizenship curriculum, um, which is um, lesson plans that address um, digital le media literacy, preparing students um, for the world um, online. 
And there's a variety of topics. We've got media balance well and well-being, privacy and security, digital footprint and identity, relationships and communication, cyberbullying, uh, digital drama and hate speech, and news and media literacy. And that's on commonsense.org. Awesome. Well, I have to say we are super on time, <laughs> which never happens. So you have a big, yes, round of applause. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the time, you know, we've talked about some pretty meaty things here. Um, this is a very big topic. Um, so this is our opportunity to open up our lines. Uh, you can share your videos. If you're not comfortable doing that, of course, you can use the chat um, and type in any chat questions that you have in there. Um, but yeah, let's open it up to the group. And yeah, who whoever wants to go first, just unmute your line. And yeah, we can start sharing and talking and yeah, hopefully feeling good uh, leaving this call. I feel like in my home, our, our sort of attempt at this, you know, is has been to keep our kids Chromebooks because that both kids have a Chromebook from school that they have access to in the evenings. So, you know, we have the Chromebook, we have an iPad in the house, um, but we make sure that those are in our living room. So, you know, everything that they're doing on them, we're observing in the background or um, anytime I hear something coming from those uh, devices that I don't appreciate or feel like this conversation, you know, so often on the videos that my kids are watching, the tone of voice the, the characters have is something I'll, you know, sort of um, have a reaction to. And so, you know, I'll, I'll point that out to them. I'll say, I don't like how they're talking to each other or, um, um, I, you know, if it's something like within a video that is in itself okay, we'll keep watching it together. But I always sort of point out that when those situations are arising, like how, how the characters are interacting with each other, if they're caring for each other. I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I always worry when things get quiet. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, especially when they're little, that's always the indicator, right? Like, why is it so quiet around here? Um, but yeah, I have a five and soon to be six year old and a seven year old. And yeah, I've found them. I'm like, why is it so quiet? And then I find them with their iPad, you know, that's like I hide in a closet that's usually locked, you know, and yeah, I'm like, Mar, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then you can hear all that dialogue that's happening. It's like, hmm, yeah. We talked about, yeah, not watching these kinds of shows. And oh, okay. Yeah. So it's it's a tricky one. How about for others who have older kids or yeah, different age group kids, minor littles? Yeah. Their web settings private and invisible. Kelly just put that in there. Yeah, incognito is a big one. Um, one that I run into far more often than I would like is uh, when I talk with parents and adults about, you know, concerns that they have about what their children are doing online. I will um, ask them, you know, like, have you actually watched any of the videos from those influencers? Have you? sat down on your own time to basically study what they're like, do you actually know what they're looking at or are you just going off of the names? Um, and that's, that can be really eye-opening um, because as, as the conversation going on in the chat, you know, like it is very easy to delete information and it is, um, if, if a kid has access to incognito mode, then, you know, they don't have to worry about their history being accessed, um, which means that if, when those are happening, the only way that you get that information is by having a direct conversation with your child and, you know, building that relationship so that you can have an open conversation. Um, but yeah, like watch the YouTube channel that your child is watching. Um, at least check out a couple of the videos. Absolutely.
Yeah, and we see some conversations in the chat, you know, we, yeah, try to approach this in a very holistic way, but yeah, this, the, you know, this topic in particular is very important for youth mental health and yeah, the, the serious, seriousness around that um, is very much present. And yeah, all, I love all of the sharing and the practical tips that we can take home and um, start to work on. And I love the approach of it being a community approach. Um, we can't do this, you know, as, you know, single individuals or teachers or educators. This has to be something that we work in partnership with each other and um, building those relationships with each other um, and taking that community approach. So I appreciate that, um, that conversation there. And I do see um, Becky's got, um, Becky's got a hand up there. So I'll hand it over to Becky. <laughs> Hey y'all, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciated it and learned a lot. Um, I think media literacy, I don't have any kids. I do want kids, but I want lots of kids. But I'm also scared because of this. Like, I didn't have this type of like media stuff. Um, I'm an elder millennial, so it's like this is, you know, even new to me. But I'm terrified of uh, you know, what's out there. And children are really smart, um, especially when they have. Um, like iPhones at like two years old. My little nieces and nephews know how to like um, navigate and do all that stuff. But I do sex ed and I go into the classroom and the kids have those like um, screen, like screen protectors, but it like reflects unless you're looking at it directly. And so they know how to hide those. Um, and so that's kind of, I mean, I, I think that's pretty creepy. And then also I mean, just grooming in general, not by another human, but grooming by um, different themes on like TikTok, uh, strip talk, for example, really romanticizes and glorifies like the sex trade industry. And like our young women and girls already have like low self-esteem due to like beauty standards that we have. And so it's, it's really tough, but I also understand parents work, especially single parents or caretakers, and sometimes like all they can do is just give them like a screen to look at to keep them, you know, busy while they're exhausted. Um, it's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it and I, I understand, but I think th this would be really great for parents to get this information because I don't think a lot of parents are aware, you know, of what their kids are watching, what's on TikTok. TikTok doesn't have any filter. Um, you can basically just look up anything. And then I know like not a few years ago, um, you could do hashtag sex, hashtag porn into Instagram and then like naked images and porn would pop up too. So it's scary out there. Yeah, thanks, Becky. And, and I think the, the importance of, yeah, this community aspect here and sharing, you know, with parents, you know, because sometimes, you know, if you need a baby, you know, mom's working, you know, <laughs> dad's working, you know, grandma's working, um, but sharing things like those parental controls, um, you know, and we, we can't do everything, right? But yeah, we're building this awareness, we're taking steps. Um, yeah, we're incorporating our wellness moments and taking those deep breaths, you know, when our chests start to feel tight and, you know, it all seems very overwhelming. Um, so it's all these little things, um, yeah, that I appreciate you bringing up there. And sorry, I jumped in before if anybody else had a, a response for Becky as well. Yeah, I think it, it's a good point to make that some social media websites are better for youth than others. Like I wouldn't really recommend like Twitter for a younger youth because there is very limited um, like safety controls on Twitter that you can post any type of pornographic content as I understand on Twitter. But now I, I think that like Facebook and Instagram have a lot stricter policies around pornographic images on their content. I think TikTok has um, some pornographic um, blocking, but then it also does have like what Becky was talking about, like strip talk where you know, people are posting this like glamorized version of what being a stripper might be like, where you make all of this cash, but you know, that might not be the reality of how it actually is in that industry. So I definitely, yeah, sugaring also, yeah, where you are like encouraging kids to become sugar babies and stuff like that. So yeah, I agree.
looks like Katie has her hand up. Hi, yes. Um, so I'm a, a licensing worker who works in foster care with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, and I'm working primarily with kinship care providers. So uh, relatives, particularly grandparents, raising grandchildren more often than not, and kind of ideas on how to get the elders that I'm working with to sort of engage with this, because what I'm seeing a lot of is like they, this wasn't a thing that, that happened when they were youth. They don't value it. They don't understand its value to the kids. And they just kind of put their hands up and look, oh, I don't know about any of that. And like trying to connect with them, like, I know this wasn't available when you were younger, but it is now and your kids are going to use it. And um, or they just struggle to use technology at all. So they're always many steps behind where the children that they're caring for are, you know, they can barely turn their phones on, much less navigate social media controls. So it just any kind of idea answer, right, sorry, that I've yeah. seen around that. Um, we've heard of sort of youth teaching elders how yes, to that's use the going. technology. <laughs> and it seems like really fun way to kind of turn the, you know, the that around by like giving the kids a set of skills that they want to model or share with the elder and, and that kind of destigmatizes the tool itself and empowers the elder to use it. And if the youth and the elder can be, you know, texting or FaceTiming each other using those tools, um, everyone will get a little more comfortable around using it. That's just one idea I've seen. I was thinking the same stuff. I was writing some notes down and I was thinking it would be a lovely opportunity for relationship building. And Jane put that in the chat there too, but I'm thinking if there could be like a pairing with like an elder and a youth and, you know, if the youth shares, you know, something that is, you know, their favorite app or their favorite game or their favorite show or, you know, some, you know, YouTube channel or whatever. Um, and then if you have like some set parameters around that, maybe some like a little bit of guidance for sharing. Um, and then the elder um, can then in turn share something um, with youth. So it's, yeah, and maybe that's built into, you know, an existing program that you're using. Um, but yeah, and, and we hear a lot from youth and from elders, you know, we want to build these relationships, these intergenerational relationships, but we don't know how, there's not opportunities for it. Um, yeah, so that, that would be something I would maybe. And I think a, a big part of that is uh, approaching this conversation between youth and elders as an opportunity to build a relationship, as a chance to spend time together as a bonding opportunity, instead of thinking of it as like a power struggle or trying to get control or teaching the elders so that they can control their youth's um, tech use, because we, like it or not, you know, the kid will shut it down. Um, when if they feel threatened about access to their own technology uh, and elders yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely you know like it's everybody yeah <laughs> there's so much uh emotionality involved in this and I've been thinking about it a lot but you know like a big one of the big reasons why it's so emotional is because for youth nowadays this is their entire social network um they don't have much of an opportunity to spend time physically with other people. So they're, they're genuinely talking to and connecting with their friends, or they believe that they have a relationship with that influencer that they're consuming the content from, right? Like that parasocial relationship is very real too. And so something that was very, very briefly mentioned that I just want to reiterate is you can't just say like, oh, get off of the phone. You have to provide something for that void of what happens after they're off of the phone, you know? So like, even that could be an opportunity with um, helping youth build relationships would be like, we are going to get off of our phones and for the next 15 minutes, we're gonna talk, play, do something together that doesn't require technology. But that yeah, it's like, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say like, you know, it's, a lot of this is like loneliness and isolation. And so coming in, approaching it from that viewpoint of, you know, how do we 
build, how do we like create a little community that doesn't require the screen? Yeah. And I think that's shifting our behaviors as adults. Um, I think that's a pretty key point there. But I was gonna say, um, just thinking, we talked during our planning call a bit about the developmental um, phases that you know adolescents are at, and that impulsivity, you know, that frontal lobe not being um, developed yet, and so it is impulsive behavior. And you know, I think about, you know, our adolescents, you know, are, they act pretty similarly to toddlers. You know, you take a screen away, and it's like, boom, you know, and it's not necessarily a behavior that you know youth want to do or exhibit, but, you know, it's developmentally appropriate sometimes, you know, it's just acting impulsively. Um, yeah, so I think to reiterate the boundaries piece, um, so, you know, it's not just like snatching an eye, you've been on that too long, or, you know, snatching, you know, if I do that to my youth with anything, if I do that to my animals, like, you know, they flip out, so, yeah, thinking about, yeah, okay, it's, you know, and Steph had some good points about, you know, like, the consistency of boundaries. So like, you know, okay, the Wi-Fi gets shut off at nine o'clock every night, like that happens every night. And so we're not arguing about those things, um, you know, ahead of time. And Michelle, I see your- Yeah, Auntie, I really appreciate all this. I mean, we know that this is a common theme and um, I just had an epiphany, you know, Lots Yay. of chatter in the in the chat feed about you know having conversations and and you know I think really what would be helpful is if you have your means in your communities or in your organizations parent elder meetings or youth discussions this would be an excellent opportunity to think about having a learning circle bring your elders together bring your youth together uh, maybe bringing in some other key folks as um, I hate to be so public health community needs assessment, but, you know, having a virtual conversation like this and really think about how to have all the voices come together and talk about this. And what would that community response be of elders and youth and those in between about how to go about this, get this acknowledgement and community um, approach I'll just say I'm very partial on this topic. And Katie, thank you for raising that conversation. I'm promoting our tools for caring adults. The talking is power. And, um, you know, because I, I uh, am a boarding school baby. I grew up with two parents that went to Indian school that, um, you know, and I too, I'm an elder Gen Xer. So still didn't even have um, email when I was in college. So but I, my family raised my nieces and nephews and now they're parents. And so we've got four generations. And the thing about it is, is I just remember the slide that Steph showed of the youth health tech survey. A lot of our youth are wanting to know who they are and where they come from. And they're going online. <laughs> And I think with talking as power and other things for myself and the elder generation, the boomers and older, they're trying to learn how to communicate with our youth today. And the question is, is how can we all be askable human beings? I think is, and take away this fear. And I think if we're willing to learn and spend time, and that's the whole merit message about this whole community of practice, taking the power back. You know, we really, really need to lean on our culture because our kids want to know. We as older folks need to share that information. And I think if you have a commonality of like cultural resilience and pride and how to utilize that in discussion, you might see more of a response from our young people in that way and gravitate towards hearing from their elders as their influencers or their caring adults versus going so much on TikTok and on these other areas. I, I mean, I hate to sound kind of judgy, but that's where I come from with my family and my approach with my nieces and nephews because they're so now ready to hear it. And now they're the, the, the caring adults and they're young people. So just words of wisdom professionally, personally, but a plug for talking is power and mind for health. And then send your kids to We Are Native or I Know Mine, so. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. 
We've got a little bit of time if, if maybe, yeah, one or two more people want to share. Um, and then we'll wrap this call up. Paula, I saw a great comment about um, some work that you're doing at the Boys and Girls Club. Yes, our program, yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, our program just recently transitioned to a uh, um, trail curriculum. And a lot of that, um, one of the activities we were just able to recently do was do our youth were able to interview some elders. And so it was a really good experience for the youth to be able to ask questions to the elders about like when they were young kids. And then there was like a 15 year age gap. It was between both my mom and my aunt, actually. So there is a 15 year age gap between the two of them to kind of really speak on their times, like things they did day to day, um, what type of foods they ate how they traveled. So, you know, they were just really able to interact and stuff. And I'm just hoping that, you know, in the future, it's something we could do a little more often. And I think that that would help in a sense, especially if we geared it towards digital media, you know, maybe they could talk about yeah. their times were without that as compared to our kids now who use that. I love that idea. Yeah, that makes me think that would be a really cool resource. Um, Maybe if you want to share, we can connect later, Paula, about your interview questions. Um, we can put those up and share those with folks. Um, but that could be really cool. Um, cool. Yeah, it was a it was a really great experience. You know, I mean, even you know, we we see such a disconnect with our our older elders in our communities and then the youth in general. And you know, it it made the elders feel really good that you know the youth wanted to take that time to spend, even if it was a half hour with them. You know, they they enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And it just it made me um think about like, you know, program planning. That would be a really powerful opportunity to bring those two groups together. Um, you know, you start with the interviewing um, where the youth is learning about what the elders perspective is like, but then the next time they meet, you invert it. And now the youth is empowered because they're the expert on the technology um, and they're explaining it to the elder, which also removes some of that like sense of control <laughs> that um, can come up with it. But yeah, this is really exciting. Like these are some really solid suggestions and ideas that people are sharing. So thank you for participating. Yeah. And Melissa, uh, it sounds like you had a similar experience um, with an assignment when you were younger. I'm sorry, I'm using my computer and my phone. So hopefully <laughs> it's working. Um, yeah, I have the wrong headphones with me today. But yeah, I think um, I was really lucky because I grew up in a big family and, um, you know, had a lot of like elders who told me their story, but like that's not everyone's circumstance. Um, and so something that I thought was really cool that our school did was we already had like um, charity work that we did at a specific nursing home and so like there was a little bit of familiarity with it but I think it would have still been fine even if there wasn't um but yeah if, if there were kids that like felt like they had no one to go to for that assignment they basically bust us down the street um <laughs> and we were able to spend time like interviewing and I oh the Volume went out. <laughs> Sorry, I was basically done. So, well, I love uh, kind of leaving on this note here, um, and I think yeah, it's really wonderful to think about um, the experiences that we had as youth that really impacted um, us as adults, um, and thinking about how we can create that experience. Um, for the youth that we work with. Um, it's really, really nice way to, to leave this uh, call here. Um, but I'll just go ahead and thank you all for being on the call and for sharing. Um, and then just leave you with a couple of things and Michelle threw a couple of these out here. But if you haven't gone to the Healthy Native Youth website, um, 
please check it out. This is where we put all the recorded sessions, all of the resources for these community practice calls, um, the curriculum, the standalone lessons, the resources, everything we talk about um, and share is on the Healthy Native Youth website. So please uh, take a moment and get lost in it. And we did mention we are native. So this is our youth multimedia um, website. Um, of course, all the social channels. We have our Ask Your Relative uh, Q&A service. We have our text message service. Um, but it's good, um, as we mentioned, for adults to know all of the content that are recommended for youth. So please check that out and share with youth. And then the Alaska version of um, We Are Native is I Know Mine. Um, so if you are in Alaska or um, know some folks in Alaska, please share um, the I Know Mine resource. Yep, lots of uh, good resources there. They've got Ask Nurse Lisa. They have um, your I Want the Kit, Get Condoms um, from their website. And then just... Um, a couple text messaging services um, to let folks know about. So we have a youth and a college and a veterans caring message um, text message series. And this is a suicide prevention intervention. Um, and it's essentially a collection of really beautiful and supportive um, and inspiring messages um, from these different age groups um, that get shared out to folks who um, sign up for the text message service. And this is uh, a resource that you can share digitally. Um, there's a QR code if you want to grab your phone real quick and you can save this um, to your phone. So if a youth um, or yeah, if you're ever in, in need of looking up resources for youth, um, this is something that you can share with them. Um, but it's broken down into different categories. It's hyperlinked. Um, and then um, that also gets hyperlinked um, to this uh, link tree that we have. Um, and this is from our Thrive uh, Suicide Prevention Mental Health uh, Project. So you get all those really wonderful resources in one spot there. And then Michelle uh, mentioned Talking is Power. So this is our text message service um, to get the conversation started um, with youth, uh, giving you uh, tips and conversation starters um, around talking to youth about sexual health. On uh, Healthy Native Youth uh, website too, there's lots of really wonderful uh, digital um, resources there as well. And then we talked about this last month, um, but Mind for Health is um, another text message service. Um, and I re would recommend maybe starting off with Talking is Power first, and then you can go to Mind for Health, but maybe sign up for one campaign at a time. Otherwise, all the messages get jumbled up. Um, but Mind for Health is about how to nurture conversations on a community level um, with youth, um, building our mental health uh, toolbox together. And then if you haven't signed up for a newsletter yet, um, you can do that on the website or take out your phone and uh, pull up that QR code there um, and you'll stay up to date with the latest and the greatest. And then our last call for this community of practice year is next month um, on Community is Power. Um, and we, it's always a great finisher because we always talk about community and weave that in throughout our calls. And so we'll spend uh, our time talking about uh, community during that call. And we do love helping. So if you want to follow up with today's conversation, um, if you want to share some feedback on um, this call, that is always super helpful. And we use all of the information that we get uh, in creating resources or adapting um, but having that in our ears is always good. And a big thank you to the Project Red Talent team. So we don't do this alone, certainly. Um, we've got the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, the Intertribal Council of Arizona, Johns Hopkins, uh, Southern Plains Tribal Health Board, University of Texas, um, and then uh, of course the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. And thank you to our funders. We just love doing this work. Um, Indian Health Services and Secretary of Minority AIDS Initiative Fund. Um, thank you for the funds. And we'll go ahead and close out um, today's session with a blessing. So I will pass this over to Michelle um, to end this off uh, properly. Thank you, Auntie. And thank you to all of you. It's Teacher Appreciation Week. So give it up for yourself. Woo! Thank you for all that you do.
Um, we can't do it without you. And that's a very, very precious role each of you do. So thank you. I'd just like to take a few moments here just to close this out in a good way. Great Spirit, we thank you for the good words and thoughts shared in this virtual circle of learning. As we part from here as one mind today, may you strengthen each one of us in these lessons learned in our collective work as caring adults in the lives of the young people. Please watch over us, keep us strong in spirit to be patient and kind. Please help guide us as we navigate this world of modern technology and staying connected in a good way at home at school and in our communities and world. Creator, we thank you for this time in gratitude, all our relation. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you to each of you for being on today's call. Um, wishing you a great rest of the day and we'll catch up with you guys next month. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.